The angels beckon me to heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Amen. This world is not our home. Amen. The people of this world are really not your friends. The same salvation that changed your life and made you who you are this morning can change their life. He's interested in you touching Him this morning and Him touching you and Him ministering to you and Him helping you. Welcome to Naked Pentecostalism. I'm your host, Isaac Coverstone. Welcome to episode 15 of Naked Pentecostalism. In this particular episode, we're going to focus on a very important topic to the whole doctrine and denomination of Pentecost. And this is a topic that was raised in a survey that was launched in the ex-Pentecostal Facebook group. And basically, the majority of people were interested in this topic, which I think is totally valid. It's a very important uh, part of the culture. It's a part of the the overall, I guess you might say, the, the program of a typical service. So th- for the benefit of people that have never been to a Pentecostal service, there's a unique phenomenon called the altar call. And this occurs very, very consistently. I would say it's it's rare to have a service that does not include one. At least one, sometimes more than one. This is not... Uh, I, think, I think there's a handful of other denominations that also follow this, but it's more emphasized in Pentecost, I think, uh, compared to others. What is happening is, after the sermon, there is a heavy emphasis on uh, reacting to the sermon. So, in other words, there's a lot of um, peer pressure to step out of your pew and move forward towards the pulpit, towards the uh, platform of the church, or the the front part of the church. It, It creates this very intense element of of psychological pressure like everyone else is doing it just step out and and join the crowd there's usually well i would say almost a hundred percent of the time there's going to be emotional music being played um without exception it's it's almost going to be this slow uh, emotional piano piece with Sometimes vocal accompaniment, but more typically it's just a piano piece. And so, you know, the, the preacher's going to whip everyone into this emotional frenzy, and then they 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 either play on this sorrow and this need for everyone to kind of move in and and be crying and weeping and everything else, or there's going to be this great fervor. You know, and everyone's coming forward in this in this hysteria of some type, and it's hard to describe adequately if you're not there because so much of this effect, so much of this element is is driven by emotion, and it relies on the music being played and relies on all these different factors. So. A lot of people aren't aware of where that where that uh, practice came from, and it's kind of interesting how Christians in general and Pentecostals in particular tend to just kind of steal whatever methods work best from wherever they can find it. So, it you know they're they're going to use practices and, and things that are not necessarily native to their doctrine, to their religion. It's just this kind of conglomeration of whatever whatever is uh, effective. So the the altar call, this concept of of everyone, you know, bow your heads and close your eyes, everyone step forward. Uh, this became popularized in some ways by like Billy Graham and the giant crusades that he would launch and 
huge crowds of people and and they're all stepping forward and doing whatever but in reality it actually goes back even further than that in in, in again to reinforce the point this is not a scriptural practice this and in rejected this practice and condemned the practice when it first began mostly did so because it was not specified in the new testament this is something that someone just said hey this we're going to try this this works great and they started this you know on their own essentially and it it's it's, it's the result of the new religious practices that came around in mid 1800s the individual that's mostly credited with creating this this phenomenon is called his name was uh, Charles Finney now Finney grew up in uh, New York City area New York upstate I think he was originally if I remember correctly um, a Baptist I want to say he was he was raised Baptist but I could get that wrong Finney was credited with this a couple different a couple different techniques you might say in terms of things that we we associate with Pentecost but was actually came from this uh, Charles Finney he would call people out by name and say you know and, and basically ridicule them and call out their misdeeds so to speak you know and and he came up with the concept of what they called the anxious seat so someone who's thinking about becoming a Christian would step forward and they would sit in this chair and people would pray for them. And of course, you know, this creates incredible pressure on that individual. Um, he pushed the idea that women would pray out loud in public meetings. This was actually not a common practice until he came around. Um, it, you know, in modern Pentecost, we're very used to this concept of, you have a large group of people, and there's men and women, they're all praying. Well, that didn't used to be the case. And um, probably some of that stems from the New Testament passage about women primarily being silent in, uh, in, in church services. But yeah, for a long, long time, that was not common. But Charles Finney started that process. And so on top of all this, um, then he would he would also start this altar call practice. And this was, again, primarily, re you know, this was condemned by major scholars and professors of theology at that time, including um, Warfield, who was a professor of theology at Princeton. And he said, <laughs> essentially, God could be eliminated from Finney's theology without really changing its character, which is really describing the modern Pentecostal church in a lot of ways. Like so much of the practices it, it are about the sermon and the music and the emotional manipulation. And it's not necessarily about theology necessarily. It's just, we're just doing all these emotionally manipulative practices. And so a lot of things that we look at the Pentecostal movement and say, oh, this is unique to them, or this is something that they came up with, we're actually tracing it back to the mid-1800s. And these ideas just kind of stuck around for a long time until eventually um, they, they've progressed into today. Now, on top of all the altar call business, Finney also pushed this idea of uh, Christians losing their salvation, or the concept of backsliding. So he was also someone that pushed that that topic as well. I don't know if he was necessarily the first person to do it, but he definitely emphasized it. And so he was one of the individuals that pushed this idea of perfectionism, that a, a believer can reach this uh, state of sanctification where they would have no desire to to sin they they would live in complete obedience to god's law it, this this concept is is antithetical to orthodox christianity 
uh, this, this idea that salvation is something that just comes and goes depending on the state of your life. And this is very much the theology of modern Pentecost. So, yeah, it, there's so much that modern Pentecost is influenced by this one guy. It's, it's really quite impressive. And the only good thing we can say about Finney is that he was an abolitionist. He was a very vocal abolitionist. In fact, he would even deny uh, communion to someone who was a slaveholder or slave owner. So, okay, you know, the guy wasn't entirely, um, you know, he had some redeeming qualities. But for the most part, we can put a lot of the blame on, on these psychological practices on this one guy. Um, and, of course, the people that were influenced by him and, and who perpetuated the concept. Let's discuss how this altar call affects people. You know, if you just... If you just have song service and you preach a message and you let people do whatever they want, that's one thing. But the minute that you say everyone needs to move forward, everyone needs to get out of their pew, and it really creates this artificially, um, just just a very oppressive environment where the people that stay in their pews, either standing or sitting or whatever the case may be, you know, they're left in this giant sea of empty pews, and here's this group of people, the majority of the people in the sanctuary are all up front, and they all have their backs to you. And then, on top of that, the, you know, all the little kids are like, because kids don't have any real sense of, like, um, decorum, you know, or self-control. So they're all going to be turning around looking back. Oh, mommy, look at, there's the, the visitors in the back and he's, he's just sitting there and he's not doing anything. And what's wrong with him? And, and yeah, it, there's just like this enormous peer pressure that you need to get up and move forward. And, and that's intentional, right? Like this was the whole, the point of what Charles Finney was doing was we're going to create this environment where we really pressure people to make that step to get up, move forward, um, make some profession of faith. And that's how people are essentially guilt-tripped into, into joining the altar call, stepping forward. Then they're guilt-tripped into raising their hands and, and making some kind of noise with their mouth. And, and then they just get swamped with the Pentecostals that come in and pray for them. And they grab your shoulder and shake you and and everything around about this is psychological. It, it, there's nothing spiritual about it, you know, it, whatsoever. This is just uh, a physical. You know, you're surrounded by other people all yelling at you and doing stuff, and then there's also this huge emotional stress that, like, here's all these people that were so friendly to you when you walked in the door, and you're starting to like them. Now they're pressuring you to do something. And you feel somewhat obligated, just a little bit guilt tripped, into you know making them happy and 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 doing whatever they're asking you to do. And this is an effective tactic. Like yes, it produces results, not a hundred percent of the time, but but it is something that works shockingly well. And so the practice continues, and, and it's perpetuated across, again, more than one denomination follows this, but um, it's more common among the, the churches that are non-Orthodox, the ones that are just kind of, they're making it up as they go. Because without the emotionalism, without this, this psychological pressure, they don't have anything. You know, everything revolves around the music being the right pitch and, and the preaching being the right amount of energy. Everything comes down to how much can we manipulate a person's mental state. And that is why the altar call is so essential in Pentecost, because they don't have any other support, any other system that's going to um, be valid, I guess I would say. So that's essentially what we're at with the, um, 
with the altar call, um, you know the history of it. We know kind of how it works in a typical service and why they do it. And it, it's, it's a very fascinating topic. And I hope that you've learned something. And I hope that um, you won't fall for it. And if you get, if you happen to find yourself in one of those services, just know, know it for what it is. See it for what it is. And, um, and don't be fooled. Anyway, appreciate you guys listening, and we'll see you next time. God's able to work out the trouble in your life. He's able to work out the problems that you deal with. God loves you. God cares about you. God's going to change things.